Welcome to the deep dive. You're here because you want to understand the world. And while that includes how information can sometimes be gathered, maybe without anyone realizing it, mm. we're cutting through the jargon today, giving you the uh, the essential insights on electronic eavesdropping, mm. the tech, how it works, why it matters. Right. Our goal in this deep dive is really to unpack five key electronic eavesdropping technologies for you. We've sifted through, you know, expert intelligence assessments, look at real world examples, some technical specs too. Trying to bring you the important stuff efficiently. Exactly. Yeah. No dense textbooks here. We're talking about the surprising stuff, things you might think only happen in spy movies, but uh, they absolutely do. Oh yeah. From Cold War secrets right up to modern cyber threats. Okay. Let's dive in. First up, something that sounds straight out of science fiction. Yeah. Laser microphones. Shining a light. Quite literally. Huh. Yeah. What's really remarkable about laser mics is how they work. You basically bounce a laser beam off a surface, say, a window in a room. When someone speaks inside, the sound waves make that window vibrate. Just microscopically. Great. Tiny vibrations. Tiny vibrations. The reflected laser beam picks those up. And by analyzing how that reflected light changes, you can actually reconstruct the original sound. Wow. So you're reading sound off a window pane. Essentially, yes. <laughs> it's pretty clever. That sounds almost impossible. But this isn't just theory, right? Have these actually been used? Oh, definitely. Historically, intelligence agencies are believed to have used them uh, quite a bit during the Cold War, listening in on embassies and such. Uh -huh. And more recently, well, relatively recently, 2003, there was a confirmed case. Diplomatic buildings in Germany targeted with laser eavesdropping. So that classic spy movie scene, it's actually real. Okay, our sources kind of rank these things. Scientific complexity, usefulness, cost, how detectable they are, practicality. What stands out for laser mics? Well, connecting it to that broader picture, they are scientifically quite complex. You need right. precise calibration, very specific equipment. Their usefulness or applicability is moderate. Because you absolutely need that reflective surface. Like the window. Like the window, exactly. Yeah. And a clear line of sight. No obstructions. Cost is high. Specialized tech, as I said. <laughs> but detectability is low. If you don't know it's there, it's very hard to spot. Mm -hmm. But then practicality comes back down to moderate. It's very dependent on the environment being just right. Got it. So that surface dependency, that's the big weakness. Close the curtains and you're kind of out of luck. Pretty much, yeah. A major limitation. All right, let's move from light beams to something that messes with our phones directly. IMSI catchers, often called stingrays. Yeah. These sound inherently uh, covert. They are designed that way. What's interesting is how they exploit a basic function of your phone. Your phone is always looking for the strongest cell tower signal, right? Yeah, to connect to the network. Exactly. An MSI catcher pretends to be a legitimate cell tower. It just broadcasts a signal that appears stronger than the real ones nearby. Ah, uh, so it tricks the phone. Precisely. Any phone in range automatically thinks, oh, great signal. Yeah. And connects to the catcher. So my phone thinks it's talking to, I don't know, Verizon or AT&T, but it's actually connected to this fake tower. What happens then? Well, once that connection is made, the operators can intercept quite a bit call information like who you're calling, text message data, if it's unencrypted. It's unencrypted text, okay. And crucially... They can also get location data, track where the phone is. That is a lot of access. Is this actually used or is it more of a, you know, theoretical oh, risk? It's definitely used. Our sources point to law enforcement agencies using them in investigations. There was that uh, 2011 bomb plot case in Washington, D.C., where one was reportedly used. Right. And the Stingray brand from Ares Corporation, that's probably the most well-known type. So how do these IMSI catchers stack up? Complexity, applicability, cost detectability, practicality. It's an interesting mix. Scientifically moderate complexity. They're exploiting existing cell protocols, not inventing something totally new. Okay. Applicability is high. They can potentially target any mobile device nearby. Cost, moderate to high. These commercial units aren't cheap. Right. Detectability is uh, low to moderate. Huh. There are specialized detectors, ways to see if your phone's talking to something suspicious, but they aren't widespread. I see. And practicality is high. Real-time interception is possible. A very powerful tool, it sounds like. And I read somewhere that the fancier ones can do even more. Yes. 
The more sophisticated versions, they have extra tricks. They can sometimes grab unencrypted metadata, so not the content, but who called who, when, for how long, that kind of thing. Ah, the data about the communication. Exactly. Like and some can even force your phone to downgrade its connection, maybe push onto an older 2G network. Why would they do that? Because 2G has weaker, or sometimes no, encryption makes the actual eavesdropping much easier. Huh. Definitely makes you think twice about what your phone's connecting to. Okay, let's switch gears. Something maybe a bit more old school spycraft. Hidden audio bugs. Covert transmitters. Tiny microphones and everyday objects. Exactly that. The core idea is simple. Hide a tiny microphone and a small transmitter inside something completely ordinary. Could be a pen, a lamp, a USB charger, mm. anything. And it just broadcasts the audio? Yeah, it relays the captured audio wirelessly to a receiver nearby. Yeah. Classic covert listening. And we've seen this kind of thing pop up even recently, right? It's not just historical. No, not at all. Remember that case in 2019? A bug found in a German MP's office in Berlin. Oh, yeah. The suspicion fell on foreign intelligence. Shows that even this, let's say, simpler tech still has its place. So how do these basic hidden bugs rate on our scale? Complexity, applicability, cost, detectability, practicality. Well, thinking about the overall picture, scientific complexity is generally low, often just off-the-shelf electronics cleverly packaged. Makes sense. Applicability, though, is high. You could adapt them to almost any indoor environment. Cost is low. Cheap to make. Easy to deploy lots of them if needed. Okay. Detectability is moderate. You could use RF sweepers to look for rogue radio signals, but a well-hidden, maybe low-power bug can still be tricky to find. Right. And practicality is high. Usually very easy to plant and activate. Simple, cheap, effective. Sounds like a potent combination. Now, the sources also mention RF bugs and GSM bugs specifically. Are those different from the general idea? They're types of hidden bugs, differing mainly in how they transmit the audio. An RF bug uses radio frequencies, broadcasts, like a tiny radio station, to a receiver that needs to be within range. Could be short range, could be longer, depending on the power. Okay, so limited by distance. Right. It often needs a power source nearby or relies on a battery. Now, a GSM bug is more modern, in a way. It uses the cellular network. Like a tiny cell phone? Kinda. It has its own SIM card inside. To listen in, you just dial the bug's phone number. Seriously? Yep. It answers silently, activates the microphone, and transmits the audio back to you over the phone network. You could be anywhere in the world with cell service. Whoa, that's a huge difference in range and convenience. Any famous examples of these? Sure. RF bugs have a long spy history. Lots of stories about diplomatic posts being bugged. That famous one, the Great Seal Bug. Vaguely remember that. Gift given to the U.S. ambassador in Moscow back in the Cold War. Had a passive RF bug inside. No battery. It was activated by radio waves beamed at it from a Soviet building across the street. Very clever for its time. Wow. Passive. And GSM bugs. Because they're so easy to use remotely, they've become pretty common tools in all sorts of surveillance, not just high-level espionage. Right. So how do the rankings compare for RF versus GSM bugs? It's interesting to see the slight shifts. Scientific complexity for both is still low, basic tech. Okay. Applicability for RF bugs is maybe medium because of that range limitation. But for GSM bugs, it's medium to high. The cellular network is almost everywhere. True. Cost for both is low to moderate. Detectability is medium for both RF scanners. Might find RF bugs. While GSM bugs can be harder to pick out from normal cell traffic, but still potentially detectable. And practicality. High for both, really. Yeah. But GSM bugs with that remote dial-in feature, that's almost fire and forget. Plant it, leave, listen whenever you want. Fire and forget. Yeah. Yeah, that is a bit unsettling. Okay, let's move into the purely digital realm now. This next bucket includes VoIP and network eavesdropping, wiretapping, and the big one. Spyware and malware feels like a totally different game. It really is, because now we're talking about intercepting communications as they travel over computer networks over the internet. VoIP voice over internet protocol, so internet phone calls and general network eavesdropping involve capturing data packets. Say to packet. Yeah, the small chunks that digital information is broken into for transmission. If the communication, like a VoIP call or website data, isn't encrypted, tools called packet sniffers can grab those packets off the network and reassemble the information. And we know governments and others use these techniques, right? Absolutely. That big breach back in 2015, the company called Hacking Team. I remember that. It revealed just how widely governments were using tools to intercept VoIP, steal files, monitor network traffic, really pulled back the curtain on state-level capabilities. So how do these network interception methods rank? 
thinking about how we communicate now. The scientific complexity is moderate. You need to understand network protocols, maybe get access to the network itself. Right. Applicability is high. So much of our communication is digital now. Costs can be quite low. Often just software tools are needed. Okay. Detectability. Moderate. The big countermeasure here is encryption. If data is strongly encrypted, just sniffing the packets doesn't reveal the content. Encryption is key. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And practicality is high. These methods can be scaled up to monitor huge amounts of traffic. Okay. Now, what about wiretapping? That term sounds more direct, like physically clipping onto a phone line. Exactly. Traditional wiretapping was about physically tapping into phone lines. That still happens. But today, wiretapping also, maybe more often, refers to intercepting digital communications at key points in the network. Like at the internet service provider level. Yeah. Potentially, yes. Or other network choke points. And in many places, there are legal frameworks, like Soleil in the U.S., that require telecom companies to build in capabilities to help law enforcement conduct authorized digital wiretaps. We've definitely heard about wiretapping in major events. For sure. Watergate is the classic example of illegal physical wiretapping. Right. But more recently, you have things like the NSA's PRISM program, which involved collecting digital communications data, sometimes with cooperation from tech companies. And of course, law enforcement uses court-ordered wiretaps routinely in organized crime cases, drug investigations, and so on. How do wiretaps rank overall? Scientific complexity is moderate. Applicability is high, covers lots of communication types. Cost is moderate, can involve equipment, legal hoops. Detectability, if done covertly or with authorization, is generally low. And practicality remains high. It provides direct access. Okay, and that brings us to the really uh, advanced and often scary category, spyware and malware. This feels like the most invasive. That's a fair description. Spyware or malware means secretly getting malicious software onto someone's device, a phone, a computer. Without them knowing. And once it's on there. It can do almost anything the device can do. Record audio through the mic, capture video from the cameras, log keystrokes, steal files, track GPS location, monitor messages in supposedly secure apps. It's comprehensive surveillance of someone's digital life. We've heard some really alarming stories about tools like Pegasus recently. Yes, Pegasus spyware from NSO Group is the big example, reportedly used against journalists, activists, even heads of state. And the really worrying part is the development of zero-click exploits. Zero-click, meaning... Meaning the spyware can be installed on the phone without the target having to click a malicious link or download anything. It happens completely silently, exploiting hidden vulnerabilities in the phone's operating system or apps. That is truly frightening. So how does spyware compare to everything else? What's striking is the sophistication. Scientific complexity is high. Finding and using those vulnerabilities, especially zero-clicks, takes serious expertise. Right. Applicability is also high, potentially total access to the target's device and data. Cost is high, especially for those cutting-edge zero-click exploits. They can cost millions. Oh. Detectability can be very low. Good spyware is designed to hide itself extremely well. And practicality, high. Once it's installed, it provides persistent, deep surveillance. A very concerning picture of digital intrusion potential. Okay, last one. We're going into a more exotic area. Electromagnetic eavesdropping, specifically Tempest, sometimes called Van Eck freaking. Sounds very niche. It is pretty niche, but it's based on real physics. Right. Tempest is about capturing the unintentional electromagnetic signals that all electronic devices give off when they operate. Think computer monitors, keyboards, printers. So you're not hacking it, you're not bugging it, you're listening to its electronic noise. Essentially, yes. These faint emissions or emanations carry information about what the device is doing. With very sensitive specialized equipment, you can capture these signals from a distance and reconstruct the data, like seeing what's on someone's screen by analyzing the monitor's electronic leakage. You're kidding. That actually works. It can, yes. Yeah. It's not science fiction. Declassified documents show that intelligence agencies like the NSA were aware of and likely using Tempest techniques decades ago back in the 80s or even earlier. So this isn't just theoretical. No. It highlights that even seemingly negligible electronic emissions can potentially leak sensitive information. Okay. How does Tempest rate then? It sounds incredibly complex. It really is. If we place it in the landscape, scientific complexity is very high. It requires deep knowledge of physics, signal processing, plus that specialized gear. Right. Applicability is moderate. It tends to work best against specific types of older or less shielded devices. Modern devices are often better protected. Cost is very high. 
the equipment needed is extremely specialized and expensive, and detectability low if the target environment isn't specifically shielded against tempest attacks. But practicality is also low. It's a niche technique. You'd only really use it against very high-value targets where other methods aren't feasible. Very specialized indeed. Wow. Well, that has been quite a tour, sometimes a bit unsettling, through the world of electronic eavesdropping. It covers a lot of ground. Let's just quickly recap the five main areas. We had laser microphones. Reading vibrations off surfaces. IMS eye catchers. The fake cell towers. Intercepting mobile comms. Kidden RF and GSM bugs. The classic covert listening devices. Simple, adaptable, some with long range via cellular. Then the big digital bucket. VoIP and network eavesdropping, wiretapping, spyware, and malware. Exploiting digital networks and devices. And finally, Tempest. Capturing those faint electromagnetic signals. And as we've kind of touched on for each, they all have different profiles, right? Laser mics, scientifically tricky, need that surface. I am as eye catchers. Very applicable to phones, but raise those privacy flags. Bugs, low tech, high practicality up close, digital methods. Super relevant now, but encryption is a challenge. Tempest, super high tech, super niche. Right. And our sources really emphasize that the best tool depends entirely on the situation. You know, for remote listening at a specific building, maybe a laser mic is considered, despite its limits. If the conditions are right. For tracking phones in an area, maybe an MSI catcher, accepting the risk of detection. For inside a room, maybe a cheap bug. Quick and easy deployment. For digital data, network taps or spyware, hoping to bypass encryption somehow. And for that extreme edge case, tempest against leaky electronics. Exactly. It's always a calculation. What's the goal? What are the tech's strengths and weaknesses? What resources do you have? What are the risks? Detection, failure, legal issues. It's complex. So here's a final thought to leave you with. We've seen this constant back and forth, right? Eavesdropping tech gets better, but so do countermeasures. Like stronger encryption, a better device shielding, things or sources mentioned. Exactly. So given this ongoing arms race between surveillance and privacy, what does the future look like? Where is this heading? That's the big question. How do we balance security needs with individual privacy in a world with ever-evolving technology? Something to definitely think about. Until our next deep dive, keep exploring.